I want to thank Tom and Marika for arranging this and for inviting me to talk to you about Jackson Pollock and jazz. Uh, what I'm going to do is to examine the relationship between Jackson Pollock's so-called action painting technique, uh, which reached its apogee in 1947-50, and the jazz music that he loved. Um, his spontaneous creation of free-flowing forms is often likened to jazz improvisation, specifically the bebop that was prominent at the time. And many people believe that he listened to that music while he painted. Now the question is, was Pollock responding directly to the rhythms and energies of jazz, or was the music's influence on him more oblique and subtle? And that's the question I hope to answer. When Lee Krasner was asked to contribute reflections on her late husband for a 1967 magazine article titled Who Was Jackson Pollock? She took the opportunity to set the record straight about a few of the misconceptions that had sprung up like weeds around Pollock's grave. By this time, 11 years after his death, the image of him as a hard-drinking, two-fisted, self-destructed action painter had solidified into myth. And I'm quoting Lee now. There's so much stupid myth about Pollock, I can't stand it. I'm bored with these myths, she complained. According to Krasner, his tough guy posture was bluff and bluster. He was, she said, damn decent to his friends, no matter what the situation was. She was from Brooklyn. <laughs> she also debunked his reputed inability to express himself in words. On the contrary, she knew all too well that he could be hideously verbal when he wanted to be. And she dismissed the contention that his death in a drunken car crash was actually suicide. There is no truth in this she insisted. It was an automobile accident like any other. One myth that she did not address was the image of Pollock as the embodiment of jazz music, creating his paintings while listening to records of the bebop musicians who were his contemporaries. She did, however, stress his long-standing love of jazz, which preceded by many years his breakthrough to action painting. He would get into grooves of listening to his jazz records, she recalled. Not just for days, day and night, for three days running until you thought you would climb the roof. The house would shake. Jazz? He thought it was the only other creative thing happening in this country. The other creative thing being abstract expressionist painting. And Pollock wasn't the only contemporary visual artist who felt a kinship with the music. As noted in the catalog of the December 1946 exhibition, Homage to Jazz, at Samuel Coots's Manhattan Gallery, uh, featuring paintings by William Baziotis, Romare Bearden, Byron Brown, Adolf Gottlieb, and Carl Holte, jazz and abstract painting, quote, are the preeminent arts of this era in this country the provocative, the original arts, unquote. Although according to Krasner, Pollock had no musical talent himself, couldn't carry a tune, and was an awkward dancer, she maintained that he had a passion for music. Indeed, he owned more than 150 records, mostly 78 RPM discs that date back to the 1930s and 40s, and his collection also includes a few of the small format long-playing 33 RPMs, and those are the ones in the front here, uh, that were introduced in the late 1940s. They are preserved at the Pollock Krasner House in Springs, where the two artists settled in 1945. Only a handful of the 78s are on display, however. Apparently, after Pollock's death, Krasner never wanted to see or hear them again. Perhaps her memories of those marathon listening sessions had soured her on them, particularly prompting her to relegate them to the attic, where they sit to this day. On the shelf under them, I found this newspaper dated November 15, 1956, three months after Pollock died. Roasting summers and freezing winters have taken their toll on the fragile shellac discs. But uh, even the playable ones are pretty worn bearing out Krasner's contention 
uh, that Pollux, uh, of his increasing, sorry, his incessant listening habits. What is this music that so captivated Pollock that he played it nonstop for days on end? And what role, if any, did it play in his creative process? Was he consciously seeking to emulate the free-flowing improvisational technique of such bebop pioneers as Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Charlie Parker, Kenny Clark, Thelonious Monk, and Max Roach? Was he, in effect, imitating them? Did he listen to their music while he painted? Now, the first question and the last question are easy to answer. First, what did he listen to? Pollock's jazz record collection is dominated by music that was popular in the 1920s and 30s, when he was in his teens and 20s. It comprises primarily traditional Dixieland, New Orleans, and ragtime tunes by such major stylists as James P. Johnson, Louis Armstrong, Kid Ory, Fax Waller, and Jelly Roll Morton, and some lesser known names like my favorite, Nappy Lemaire's Louisiana Levy Loungers. <laughs> There are the Chicago sounds of Jack Teagarten, George Wetling, and Art Hodes, big band music by Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, Russell Bennett, Lionel Hampton, Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, Eddie Condon, Teddy Wilson, Woody Herman, and Count Basie, vocals by Billie Holiday, and piano standards by Eddie Duchin, and folk songs by Mahalia Jackson, Burl Ives, and Josh White. According to his friend, B.H. Friedman, Pollock was not receptive to vanguard jazz. In the mid-1950s, Friedman accompanied him to clubs like Eddie Condon's in Greenwich Village, where the fair was a mixture of Dixieland and Chicago style. He loved Fats Waller, Friedman told me. He used to talk about him a lot. The Pollock Krasner House collection includes a record of the boogie-woogie piano player Jimmy Yancey, which you saw on the left by the turntable. It was a gift from Friedman, who tried in vain to interest Pollock in bebop. As it happens, there is a jacket for a bebop album on the shelf below the record player, but the 78 records inside are standards, like T for Two, I Got Rhythm, and Embraceable You, played by Victor Arden, Bob Crosby, and Bob Selvin's Knickerbockers. Pollock evidently discarded the missing platters, featuring Clark, Gillespie, and other boppers. The collection also includes a Charlie Parker LP that was given to Pollock by his lover, Ruth Kligman, uh, just a few weeks before his death in 1956. She assumed that he'd go for it, since Parker's improvisational style seemed so in tune with Pollock's, but he didn't. She may have been crazy about him, but as far as his taste in music was concerned, she told me, I thought he was a real square. That opinion was echoed by Larry Rivers, who was a professional jazz musician before he became a visual artist. Even after he gained recognition as a painter, Rivers continued to play the saxophone and organize several bands, the first of which, Larry Rivers and his Mudcats, was the debut of his nom de guerre. His real name was Yitzhak Loisa Grossberg. He sometimes played at Jungle Pete's, a local watering hole in Springs, where Pollock was a regular. This is Larry speaking now. He'd come around in the evening from his afternoon drinking and still be there at nine o'clock or something like that when we'd start, Rivers told me, or told Jeffrey Potter, uh, one of Pollock's biographers. Uh, then he'd ask for cornies like, I can't give you anything but love, baby, practically on the level of dopey songs, unquote. Now, an old sh show tune like that may have seemed dopey to a hipster like Rivers, but it had possibilities for Louis Armstrong in the Savoy Ballroom Five, who recorded it in 1929, and that recording is in Pollock's collection. As to the question of whether Pollock uh, listened to jazz music while he painted, the answer, contrary to the myth, is no. Interviewed in 1964 on WNDT, the New York public television station of the day, Krasner was asked that question directly and answered it with an explicit no. Remember her description of Pollock's record-playing marathons. She said the house would shake. There was no record player in the studio, and there's ample photographic documentation of the inside of the building, a converted storage barn, showing that it contained neither a wind-up Victrola nor an electric turntable and amp. 
In fact, the studio had no electricity until 1953, by which time Pollock had virtually ceased painting and he completed all the dynamic chord paintings that have been likened to improvisational jazz compositions. The image of him flinging paint while dancing to the syncopated rhythms of Bird or Dizzy or Monk, like the equally misguided notion that he painted while drunk, is a fanciful one. This is not to say that jazz played no part in Pollock's aesthetic repertoire. It was a well-established source of inspiration for abstract artists, mindful of Walter Pater's observation that art constantly aspires toward the condition of music. Among those cited in Donna M. Cassidy's invaluable 1997 book, Painting the Musical City, are Aaron Douglas, Romer Bearden, Arthur Dove, Mark Toby, Pete Mondrian, Franz Klein, and Stuart Davis. Jazz was a theme for Bearden throughout his career, and Davis was a deeply devoted jazz fan who often incorporated musical imagery in his abstractions. Uh, this is a, a WPA mural uh, that was done for radio station WNYC. It's now in the Metropolitan Museum. And Davis did have jazz playing in his studio while he worked. In Pollock's case, however, the music was a respite from the creative act. His intensive work sessions would be followed by fallow periods, which became more frequent after he resumed drinking following two years of sobriety from 1948 through 1950. As Krasner once remarked, he often said, painting is no problem. The problem is what to do when you're not painting. One of the things he did uh, was listen to records. An intriguing question is whether there was a cause and effect between these passive listening sessions and his return to work. His friend and fellow artist Alfonso Osorio witnessed an occasion in 1953 when Pollock had apparently hit an impasse and tried to use music to rekindle his creative spark. As Osorio told Jeffrey Potter, quote, he had put large black and white canvases against the windows in the front room, that's where the uh, record player is in the parlor, had taken a bottle and gone in and turned the volume up full. They were all early jazz records. He did that several times. Widespread assumption that his art is analogous to jazz, little has been written on the subject. Only two art historians, Andrew Kagan and Chad Mandelas, have published articles specifically devoted to it, and they appeared more than 30 years ago in Arts Magazine. Kagan focuses on the thematic and cultural parallels, while Mandelis uh, examines the structural similarities between Pollock's painting and um, jazz composition, and also looks conversely at jazz musicians who have uh, been uh, expressed an affinity with Pollock, notably the soprano sax player Jane Ira Bloom, whose album Chasing Paint was inspired by Pollock's work, and Ornette Coleman, whose groundbreaking 1960 album, Free Jazz, reproduces a Pollock painting on the jacket. Mandelis quotes uh, Coleman as saying that, quote, he recognized in Pollock someone who um, was in the same state that I was in doing what I was doing, unquote. According to Mandelis, it wasn't Coleman's idea to illustrate a Pollock, but whoever made that decision, rather surprisingly, did not choose a classic action painting like this one, with its flowing forms and interlacing linear rhythms, but opted instead for the 1954 canvas, White Light, from Pollock, late in Pollock's career, when he had retreated from the spontaneous pouring technique that made him famous. White Light is notable for its heavy impasto and staccato strokes. Still, it could be argued that this multiple overlay of color and texture corresponded to the dense musical harmonics, chromatic variety, and vibrant nervous energy of Coleman's free jazz <coughs> idiom. In his 1979 magazine article, Andrew Kagan points to the indigenous American character of jazz as a potent source of its appeal for Pollock, and theorizes that its ascent into the cultural mainstream, both at home and abroad, paved the way for Pollock's art to be ratified. 
According to Kagan, ambitious improvisation uh, was precisely what made jazz such a significant novelty in Europe. And this is one of the jazz bands that toured widely in Europe during the 1920s. I, I absolutely love this picture. <laughs> And in Europe, he says, it came to symbolize the wildness and freedom associated with the New World and gained widespread popularity decades before American art was taken seriously. After World War II, Pollock benefited from perfect timing. As Kagan puts it, quote, to Europeans who recognized a lapse in their own artistic innovation and leadership, he appeared as a new prophet to revitalize the same and save the Western tradition in art, unquote. I think Kagan is right in supposing that, quote, the fact that Pollock was wilder, more passionate in his art, more electric, more immediate, and more improvisatory in character than, than his contemporaries surely aided him in becoming the first American painter to win that type of acceptance, unquote. The most frequent analogy between Pollock and jazz musicians, explicitly cited by Kagan and Mandelis, and alluded to by Coleman when he spoke of the painter doing what he was doing, is the improvisational nature of their creativity. Indeed, spontaneous invention is the hallmark of both free jazz and Pollock's working method. But of course, Pollock was dead before Coleman came on the scene. Obviously, in Coleman's case, the influence was one way in the direction of the musician. Whether classical jazz provided a formal model for Pollock is debatable since it typically begins and ends with an established melody, the basic tune from which the players take off. Pollock, who subscribed to Carl Gustav Jung's theory of the creative unconscious, began with a blank canvas. He had no framework other than his imagination on which to hang his inventions. In effect, he built the framework intuitively as he went along. As the critic Harold Rosenberg summarized the process in his famous 1952 essay, The American Action Painters, the image was not preconceived, but evolved as a result of the artist's encounter with his materials. A quote, each stroke had to be a decision and was answered by a new question, unquote, Rosenberg wrote. Uh, the likelihood is that however much Pollock admired jazz as an art form, enjoyed listening to it, and even looked at it or looked to it as a stimulus for work, he didn't want his art to be too closely identified with it. On the only occasion when he had the opportunity to pair music with his painting, jazz was not the genre he chose. In 1950, the photographer Hans Namath, who had taken hundreds of still photographs of Pollock at work, decided to make a movie of the painter in action. Uh, he shot, after experimenting with black and white film inside the studio, he shot color footage outdoors, where Pollock painted a long canvas on the ground and made a collage painting on glass. Working with cinematographer Paul Falkenberg, Namath edited the film and added a short narration read by Pollock. In his description of the, of the project, Falkenberg explained, quote, we felt that this film was Jackson's and that if any voice were to accompany the picture, it should be his, unquote. And they also gave him the say regarding music. To Falkenberg, the swirling elements in Pollock's painting, that's not the one that he's actually painting in the film, this is a slightly earlier one, but these swirling elements suggested the loose structured sound sequences of a gamelan orchestra. So he created a soundtrack using excerpts from the records of Indonesian music. When I ran the film of it for Jackson, Falkenberg recalled, he said, but Paul, this is exotic music. I'm an American painter. Yet he didn't recommend using jazz, the music most readily identified as American. The filmmakers approached John Cage to compose an original score, but Cage declined on the grounds that he didn't like the artist or his art. <laughs> now Cage advised them to ask his young protege, Morton Feldman, with whom Pollock soon formed an intense friendship. Feldman, who saw Pollock paint in person in addition to watching the footage, uh, told Jeffrey Potter that he scored for the film as I would for choreography, with two interwoven tracks of cello music written specifically in response to Pollock's rhythmic movements. 
It may have been true, as Krasner maintained, that he was a lousy social dancer, but when he painted, he was grace itself. According to Daniel Stern, who played both cello parts, <coughs> Feldman really adapted the sounds to what was happening on the screen, and this is a part of the sheet music for that, uh, that uh, composition. Obviously, no pre-existing piece of music, jazz or otherwise, would have corresponded so directly. Uh, in his essay for my anthology, Such Desperate Joy, Imagining Jackson Pollock, Stern describes the piece as, quote, intentional fragments that come together as a coherent whole, similar to the way Pollock's work is made. What Morty was looking for and found was an objective correlative for Pollock's act of painting, end quote. And I'm going to show you a film clip that just gives you a little taste of the music as it relates to the work. If there is a direct correspondence between Pollock's work and jazz, I believe it's to be found on the technical level, in the mastery of the artist's medium. Those who accuse both Pollock's painting and vanguard jazz of being chaotic fail to appreciate what Feldman realized, that there was form and structure in Pollock's presumed randomness, in the same way that jazz improvisation is based on rhythmic and harmonic underpinnings. Moreover, as just as the dancer works for years to make the most taxing performance seem effortless, years of practice lie behind Pollock's spontaneous gestures and the jazz musician's inventive artistry. In an effort to answer critics who saw him as undisciplined, Pollock insisted, I can control the flow of the pain, and there is no accident. Like the jazz giants whose music he loved, he relied on consummate skill to realize his expressive potential. And there's a correlation on an even deeper level. Quote, the emotion he uses liberates the rhythms and the meters, unquote. That quote is from Ornette Coleman, and although he's referring to Ed Blackwell's drumming on free jazz, he might as well have been describing Pollock painting autumn rhythm. Thank you.